Thank you, Ben. It's very nice to be a uh, part of this uh, event. So today, um, I thought that, okay, I, I, by training, I am a material scientist or chemist. Okay. And uh, when this pandemic happened, uh, 2020, correct, all of us were hit quite, uh, yeah, exactly. All of us were stuck. And we, our students were not there. And a few of us, a few faculty, basically, we thought to do something. And then uh, we came up with something about triboelectric face mask. So that's why I changed the title a little bit, a journey from nanometrials to the development of face mask during this pandemic. Okay. So again, after the pandemic is, luckily it is going away. So we are getting back to, as usual, our nanomaterial stuff. So what I thought that in this talk, I will be giving, um, a, okay, before that, let me first briefly talk about the, this. I come from Center for Nano and Soft Matter Sciences. It is under the D D Department of Science and Technology Government of India. And this is, a, we have a very small campus and, but very lively campus basically. And um, this is some of the photographs and we work on globe box, et cetera. Um, yeah. And this is a, we also focus on a lot of development of prototypes and we have a dedicated technology laboratory. That's where we um, do a lot of developments of our, we try to, whatever we are doing research in our lab, we try to take it one more step ahead and uh, make prototype and do a lot of industry interactions. So how to make a product commercialize. So that's what the idea is. Anyway, so um, as Ben, you said that um, our research group, it's, we have uh, most of our work is on understanding new materials, understanding their properties and the materials, what we are looking for primarily for photovoltaics. So we make small devices and then we see how their property varies. And to understand these material properties, of course, we use synchrotron radiations. And uh, there we use different spectroscopic technique or diffraction or photo emission spectroscopy. So these are the few things what we extensively use. And when we are making this material, we also uh, do apply for various, uh, we do use them for various applications. For example, here I have given uh, one brief example of um, heavy metal ion detection based on luminescence. So photoluminescence, which can be seen under naked eye. And then very recently we started working on something called atomic layer deposition. Today, what I'm going to, okay, this is my uh, beautiful, uh, this is all these young students. Uh, so they are the part of my research group. And uh, so today, first part of the talk, or very briefly, I'm going to talk about nanomaterials. A very brief introduction about what nanomaterials are. And from there, I will be coming to the part that development of this face mask. Okay. So the outline of the talk, nanomaterials. Uh, the filling for nano. Nano is basically nothing but a Greek word, correct? It means dwarf. So what do we mean by that? Because the size is small, small we can't really uh, understand that. And seeing is believing. And what are the synthesis approach we take to, synthesis, to make these nanomaterials? And then I'll briefly talk about general structure of nanoparticles. And then second part of the talk, what I'm going to talk about face mask. Uh, okay, and the, how we develop this triboelectric face mask, and then I'll be also briefly talking. I'll be briefly talking about how we have taken, we made this product, this uh, material, this mask, and then how it is, uh, how we commercialized it, and it is now available in the Indian market. Okay, so first part, uh, nanomaterials. What is nano? We know one nanometer. If I talk about nanometer, then one nanometer equals to one into 10 to the power minus nine meter. If we talk about seconds, one nanoseconds, then one into 10 to the power minus nine second. Now, this is a number 10 to the power nine or 10 to the power minus nine. This is a number which we generally don't deal with, correct? So this is a huge number. We don't really get a feel for it easily. So uh, if we take a hair, a typical hair is somewhere around 85 to 100 micrometers. So for the sake of easy calculation, let's take uh, one thick, one hair thickness is 100 micrometer. Now 
here if i take one here and i can touch it i can feel it that how small that is correct and if i take one here and then divide uh, divide into 100000 times then one part of it is going to be 1 nanometer so again 100000 times is is also a big number we we cannot i cannot feel it very easily if you tell me okay well, the dimension of what we work our height and etc these are so 1 to 2 meters one yeah so you see that those are the we know uh, length of a car 5 5 meters so you understand one marathon 42 kilometer but this number is really big Okay, so I try, I'm try, I'll be trying to give another example. So basically understand uh, to tell you that how small this is. Okay, I come from India and cricket is very popular here. Correct. This, this particular cricket field is in Bangalore. And let's say the diameter of this stadium is 150 meters. Now, when you are in the stadium, you can feel for how big or how, how big is the stadium. Okay. Now, if you look at this pitch, and if you take one sand grain, when you are in the stadium, you can still feel it. So you are seeing two different extreme I'm talking about one sand grain and the whole stadium. So this is the kind of the ratio we are talking about. Okay, so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to make a transformation like if I make this stadium shrunk it to a size of a A5 notebook, then the size of that small sand grain, what I talked about, that will come somewhere around 15 nanometer or so. So we are talking about, so now you, you can get a feel that how small number we are talking about. We can't see it in our naked eye. We can't touch it or we can feel it, a single nanoparticle by itself. Correct? But we know that seeing is believing. If we don't see, why should we be believing that? So how do we see this material? In several cases, uh, we see things in direct ways. So directly seeing, like what you were seeing through this slide, correct, in your presentation, in, in front of you. Or there are also indirect ways. So for example, I'm in this room. If I hear a cat mewing, or mewing outside, then I know there is a cat. Correct. Right? Although I don't see that, but I can, I can, I can guess that indirectly there is a cat outside. So there are two ways of seeing a direct way and indirect way. Now there are several techniques. Like one of these techniques, very commonly used to see nanoparticle, is transmission electron microscope. Instead of uh, light, uh, visible light, we are using electrons here to see these small nanoparticles. And whatever these individual dots you are seeing, either the black or the other one, those are each of these iron oxide nanoparticles. It does not stop there. We can, we have, or uh, there are high resolution TEM available where you can see each of these atomic columns into this, in, in this material. Yes, so we can see this material. There are several other techniques. One other technique very popular is scanning tunneling microscope, where each of these dots or blobs, what you are seeing, those are like each of the carbon atom. This this STM image was collected. Uh, I collected long time back during my PhD. I think it's now 15 years back. I've taken this uh, HOPG carbon atoms uh, on HOPG from using STM. Now, why do we need to see this? Okay, now what I have shown here is a TM image of some particle called cesium lead bromide. Okay, cesium lead bromide. It's a perovskite type structure. So it's a perovskite nanocrystals. It is very, uh, this material is very easy to synthesize and they have excellent optoelectronic properties. Today, I'm not going into that details, but why I am showing this image, you see this particle where my uh, the cursor is, you see the here, the planes, whatever we are seeing, they are perpendicular to the age of this nanocrystal, correct? In this case, perpendicular or in this, in, with, if I consider this age, this is parallel. Whereas if I consider this particle where the ages are 45 degree in angle, so the lattice planes are differently arranged. Now the question comes that do these two pro do these two nanoparticles do they exhibit different property, or they have same property? Can we synthesize any particular type of nanoparticle where all the crystals have the same lattice plane, same arrangement, or uh, so you see that there are different questions comes up, and this probably this comes out of the understanding the fundamental 
of this material but from these questions only we develop uh, once we understand that then we we will be able to on after that only we will be probably able to synthesize them of why they are forming and then the advancement and then they can be applied for a particular particular application if they have different properties so i use this slide to motivate you that yes even though the small particles uh, they may we may be not uh, synthesizing them individually but collectively we are seeing some properties but it is very important to understand the properties of these materials fundamental understanding is important okay now coming back to this how do we make nanocrystals i have talked enough about nanocrystals how do we talk, make it so you take a big crystal and then you start chipping it, cutting it, breaking it, and take a so that that's some one way, correct? And uh, this method is called top-down approach, and this is being used in several cases, particularly ceramic nanoparticles. People use it in that way in this method, top-down approach. But again, as I said at the beginning, I am chemist, so I like the chemist way. Okay, so that approach is more as bottom-up approach. So what, so let us take it in this way that I want to make a compound of AB. So what I need, I need a cation of A and an ion of B. And then when they react, they will form this AB. Now A plus, if I go and ask in the market, I don't get it. So I get a salt of A, I get a salt of B. And the salt I have to choose in such a way that A plus and B minus will be available and they will be reacting to form this AB. But when I take this way, do a reaction, this most of the time, this AB can form in bulk. That means in bigger, that is what the thermodynamic uh, pro product. So the crystal will be very big. But we want to, so when we are trying to synthesize this nanoparticle, they are most of the time kinetically stabilized product. So when they are growing, this A plus and B minus are coming for nucleating and then more A plus and B minus are coming to make this nuclei bigger. At some point, we have to bring something else to arrest the growth of this nanoparticle so that it does not go, grow beyond a certain size. And that's where these passivating molecules come into the picture. And a passivating molecules are nothing but they basically passivate the surface so no more new reactant can come. So you can arrest the growth when they are in nanoparticles. So this is one example of lead sulfide nanoparticle. Lead sulfide is being used in a lot of photo detectors and uh, also earlier people used for photovoltaics. Even in some cases, still people use that. So here you see that we take lead oxide. Now lead oxide, it does not give easily PB2+. So we use oleic acid and react with lead oxide and form lead oleate. And then sulfur precursor, we use this compound. It's called TMS or B-trimethylsilyl sulfide. So this is sulfur with connected with silicon, and this silicon is attached with three methyl group. That's why B-trimethylsilyl sulfide. And we do the reaction in a particular solvent where it does not react, and so on and so forth. So what we at the end of the reaction, what we get is a nanoparticle on the outer side. It is passivated with this molecule oleic acid. So oleic acid in this case they act as breaking the lead oxide to lead oleate plus the lead oleate when the lead oleate from the lead oleate lead reacts with sulfur forms lead sulfide this oleic acid it comes into the picture and passivate the quantum dot and uh, as i said seeing is believing so in this case well the tm image not is as not as good to what i have shown in the previous system but here each of these dots whatever you were seeing those are around 3.2 nanometer and those are each individual nanoparticle we are talking about individual nano lead sulfide nanocrystals they have interesting properties and we can explain it uh, very easily from particle in a one dimensional box in case of particle in a one dimensional box we know that for a particular quantum number n or particular in level n the energy can be n square h square by 8 ml square okay so what happens that if i talk about the energy difference between two level en and en plus 1 this energy level difference is you see that this delta e between these two two consecutive energy level it is inversely proportional with 1 over l square that is the dimension of this box when we consider a nanoparticle, we can consider that particle in a sphere, correct? 
So particle in a 3D box and convert it to a polar coordinate, so particle in a sphere. There also the idea remains same that delta E, it will be inversely proportional with one by R square or one by L square, correct? So what happens then? Now, if we consider a system, we are talking about semiconductor. So it has valence band and conduction band, and this is the band gap. So we can talk about this as one energy level, and this is the an another energy level. Okay, good. Now, if we make the particle bigger, what will happen? When the particle is getting bigger, these two energy levels, they come near to each other. So the band gap of the material decreases. And if we make it smaller then nothing but the band gap increases because it is inversely proportional. That's how given a material by tuning the size, one is able to tune the properties of this material. And, uh, and then this, uh, this band gap we talked about, and then I will be briefly introducing the photoluminescence here. We talked about the valence band and conduction band, correct? When you shine light, then an electron from the valence band, it absorbs that light. And if this energy is sufficient, then it goes to the conduction band. And then after going to the conduction band, depending upon the energy, it can go somewhere in the conduction, it can go high up. And then eventually it comes to the bottom of the conduction band and then it doesn't have find any other state. So it, recomb it recombines and it gives a photon out. That's what the photoluminescence happens. And we see in light emitting diodes, these type of properties are being used. Okay. Now, again, uh, the, the, the seeing is believing, correct? I keep on saying this one. Now, these are cadmium selenide nanoparticles, okay, of different sizes. These pictures are taken in normal normal light, in room room light under room not general condition. Now, when we sign the same material with UV light, what happens? You see that they emit different colors. The the left one it's emitting you blue, and the extreme right one is emitting red. So what is happening here as we go from blue to green to yellow to red? That means the energy is going down. So that means the band gap of this particle is going down. So although the material in all these cases are same, it is cadmium selenide, just by tuning the size, we are able to tune their optoelectronic properties or optical properties in this case, or the band gap. So it opens up a lot of new opportunities or new researches, new research fields, and people are using this material for quite some time. It's probably the last three, four decades, three decades or so people are using these materials extensively. Now, when I talk about quantum dots, quantum dots are nothing but semiconducting nanoparticles, which shows quantum confinement. Okay, and here, as I said, I give the previous slide, in the previous slide, I give the example that the size variation gives the easy tunability of the band gap. Not only size variation, one can also change the composition with this, and then it, one can also, it is possible to tune the band gap. And typically they have much higher photoluminescence compared to the bulk system. And uh, within this small four or five nanometer or 10 nanometer size, using the chemistry, uh, you can tune their chemistry in such a way that you can make different heterostructures inside this nanoparticle. The first one which I have shown is schematically, the red one is nothing but the cadmium uh, selenide, uh, pure cadmium selenide. Okay, and then on the on the surface, it has this passivating molecules. So I call this bare cadmium selenide. It has, it shows a quantum yield of around 10%. That means you shine 100 photon or if it absorbs 100 photon, uh, well, not absorbs. If you shine 100 photon, it emits 10 photons. That's what it means. But we can make the same thing, say, as a core shell. That means the core of this material is cadmium selenide. And the outside, we used another material called cadmium sulfide, which is a higher band gap. In this case, the quantum yield goes up to 50%. Uh, that's uh, interesting that we are able to tune these properties. Now, this the third example is also even more interesting is that you take cadmium and then inject sulfur and selenium precursors simultaneously. Now, due to the inherent nature of the reactivity of cadmium and selenium, which is higher compared to the cadmium and sulfur, so the core of the nanoparticle it forms cadmium selenide and the surface is more of cadmium sulfide. So we are making a gradient alloy. The core is cadmium selenide type, the outer side is cadmium sulfide type, and uh, they exhibit even higher photoluminescence efficiency around 85%. 
Okay, there are reports where people have synthesized almost 90, 95% efficiency in this type of system. Well, the opportunities are enormous. The people we have even done uh, quantum dot quantum wells. So within a quantum dot, we are making a quantum well. So it's like zinc sulfide is a high band gap material. So core is zinc sulfide, then a shell of cadmium selenide, which is low band gap, and then again, a core of zinc sulfide, and then the passivating molecules. Okay, good. So we talked about, earlier we talked about what photoluminescence is, correct? So it absorbs, when you shine photon, it absorbs the light. And then finally, when it recombines, we get the photoluminescence. And that's why the quantum dot LED TVs, which are coming out, it uses the same principle. Instead of signing the photon, you inject the electron to the valence band, uh, to the conduction band, and then they recombine and you get the very pure light. That's why the quantum dot Q to Q LED TVs are becoming very popular. This material, once you have, say, for example, you sign light, this energy is get absorbed by this electron. It has gone to the conduction band. And you can, if you can harvest that high energy electron, then you can make use of it uh, as a photovoltaics. So um, we, we are not going, so that will be like separation of the electron and hole. If we are able to do that, that will be called photovoltaics. We are not, these nanoparticles are, uh, have been used, people are using them extensively uh, for photovoltaics as well. I'm not going into the details of it, okay? Now, so far you see that I have talked about in this nanoparticle, I have talked about one inorganic part and one organic part or organic passivating molecules. Now, the quantum dot and ligand interaction that plays a lot of role in controlling the size size distribution or creating an anisotropic particle, overall stabilization of particle. It's a lot of proper opportunities are there by tuning these, uh, these properties. This is an example of gold nanoparticle where by refluxing, if you add some thiol at room temperature, it breaks down to smaller size. If you take then reflux it, then it goes to absolutely almost near uniform sizes. And then again, if you add another different passivating molecules, it goes back to what goes back to these big crystallites. Here, um, one of my um, colleague uh, Steve uh, from Stanford, they make uh, he made some tin sulfide nanoshades, and that is forming because of this passivating molecule. Um, one of my colleague, they used to synthesize the nanoparticle, which was in form of form FA formamidite. So that is a polar solvent. By adding uh, different passivating molecules, it could be transferred to a non-polar solvent in toluene. So by tuning these properties, one is able to, one will be able to uh, alter a lot of, uh, so basically one will be able to use in different applications and different cases. The opportunities are enormous, basically, in this case. Okay, good. So that is the introduction, basic introduction of the nanomaterial. And this is what I am working for uh, since my PhD almost. And now my students are also working in this field. Now, uh, let me come to the second part of this topic that which you will find that is very different from what I introduced so far on nanometrials. But yes, certainly the knowledge what I have gained from nanometrials, it has helped in developing this face mask. So development of the face mask. First of all, any mask is better than no mask. Okay, any mask is better than no mask. And then why do we need face mask? To answer this question, we need to, well, considering this pandemic situation, we need to know something very briefly. I'm, I'm not a microbiologist. I do not know the details, but very brief, some information about virus. So virus size varies between what we learned basically during the lockdown period in India, we were, I was learning these things. Virus size 5 to 200 nanometers or so. It remains hydrated or in solution and it transmitted by aerosol droplets. And the uh, another interesting point, what we figured out or what we learned, not figured out, what we learned from literature, that the need charge of a protein in solution depends on the pH. True, that is correct. And based on the isolated point of the virus, similar to that of COVID-19, it is expected that most of the viruses will have a net negative charge on the surface at neutral pH. So, if I take when I read the sentence, then I realized uh, the, the, the take home message from here that viruses will be 
charged particle. You can consider them as a charged particle. Okay, with this, we know the size. We know that they are probably in water or, uh, or in a hydrated or in aerosol and their charged particle. So these are the three key points we have picked up from the literature. Now we started looking into that uh, mask thing. And do you know that mask was developed by, um, it was designed or the respiratory mask. It was a respirator, basically. It was developed by Sarah Turnbull. Okay. This uh, basically fits very well to the face and um, it gives, um, um, typically the N95 mask, when we say that 95, it has the 95% filtration efficiency for particle of 0.3 micrometer particles, for particle size of 0.3 micrometer. How do they achieve it? It's basically the, uh, these in these in the N95 mask. Generally, what what are done, what is done is that a lot of different sizes of fibers they are kept and they're randomly placed. Okay, this is uh, what I am showing here is the FEC image of this mask mask material. So you see a lot of fibers basically. Uh, so you can think of that a lot of logs are basically kept one on top of each other and very randomly. So what happens that there is no direct line of sight for any particle to go, okay? Now, if we want to improve the efficiency of this of this uh, of this of a mask, what we can think of that we can decrease the pore size, correct? So I am schematically showing here that let's say I have certain size of pores. If I decrease it, what will happen if I decrease this? Then uh, or so if I decrease the si size of the particle, then number of particles going going down will be going down will be decreasing as well as as I am decreasing the spore size. So bigger particles, a little bit bigger particles, will not be able to get into. But number of particles are going less. That means the airflow is becoming less. So then what one has to do is one has to have lot of smaller pores. Correct. Okay? So the the question comes how to make the filtration more effective. Although if you decrease the, if we decrease the pore size, the filtration will be more effective, but there comes other issues, okay? What are the other issues? Basically, as I said, that the airflow will be restricting the airflow. That means we'll have trouble in breathing, correct? So our lung, lungs has to work much harder. So we feel uh, trouble in breathing. Then next thing is that uh, speech distortion. If I cover my mouth, say for example, I covered my mouth with my hand, you are not able to hear properly. Uh, it's natural. If when we have something in our face and if, particularly if it touches our lips, then we have speech distortion. We are not able to, um, not able to um, hear clearly. Uh, those who have eyeglasses like me, that we have issues with fogging. Uh, that's a very annoying issue. So how do we solve them? That is what we were thinking that time. And if we have these difficulties, what happens that consider all these difficulty and people tend to remove the mask, correct? I have seen uh, that when after the pandemic, when slowly things were stopping on the road, people are using in 95 mask, but they're not wearing it properly. So what is the use of it? Correct. So, um, uh, so do we need really high efficiency mask all the time? Okay, this is where, again, I am no expert, but this is the literature we came across. What it says that, uh, okay, let me take you through what is what is shown in this graph. See this number two, 1.5, 1, these are the RE numbers. So this represents that what is the uh, propagation, uh, what is the rate uh, through which a pandemic is uh, can increase. So if RE number is less than one, that means it will come to cease. Okay. On the left-hand side, what we have shown is the adherence. That means how many, what is the number of population wearing the face mask properly. And then on the, on the x-axis, what we have shown is the efficacy of the mask. Higher the number, that means mask blocks more virus particles. And in y-axis, more people wear masks, that is more effective. Okay. Now you see somewhere around 50% efficiency or so, and then a lot of people wearing it, then also the RE value can go down. Correct. So this is what, so we need some mask. So based on this data, what we feel that we need some mask, which need not be highly efficient, but 
lot of people should be wearing and why should they wear when it is comfortable then only they will wear it okay perfect and this is uh, the filtration mechanism if we talk about for a mask uh, then there are three major ways one is the inertial impaction impaction that means there is no direct uh, the particle cannot does not have any direct line of sight it hits one of the fiber and it gets stuck and then diffusion which happens with in case of smaller particle and this if we uh, carefully notice that earlier instructions were that a mask cannot be used more than a um, respirator mask and should not be used more than six to eight hours. What is the reason? The reason is that when the masks are produced, they are also electrostatically charged. Now, when we wear it, we are continuously uh, breathing in and breathing out. When we are breathing out, we are sending moist air, correct? So that charge gets continuously uh, when uh, that gets deneutralized, that gets neutralized, not deneutralized, that get neutralized. And then essentially this electrostatic attraction part, the filtration because of this electrostatic attraction goes down. That's what the suggestion was. Initial suggestion was that in 95 are certified to use six to eight hours uh, based on the charge. Okay, perfect. Now you see that we, I come to, uh, I'm showing very different image here, triboelectricity. So we, you must have seen that if we take a comb, particularly the plastic one, uh, and then we, uh, we put it, and then if we take it near paper, and we see that they are getting picked up. And this probably, this image you might have seen, the cat is covered with these polystyrene balls. Okay, And that is because of this triboelectricity or electrostatic electric, electrostatics. Okay. On the right hand side, what I have shown, what I have shown is a triboelectricity, triboelectric um, ch chart. So the left, so as we go down, they are becoming more tribo-negative, and on the positive, on the upper side from the cotton, it is tribo-positive. So if I take, say, for example, wool, okay, wool and let's say PVC or polypro polypropylene, etc. If we rub them together. Then what happens locally, the charge distribute. The wool become positively charged, the polystyrene becomes negatively charged. So that's how, how, how one can, and one can certainly determine it from experiments. So this is one example uh, you see here. What um, we are doing is that we are, uh, this is silk and this is polystyrene, and then we rubbed it. And then when we bring it near the papers, these papers are getting attracted. So we, Hello? Yeah. Okay. So the, the, sorry, the voice was actually in the video. Don't, never mind. I, I got confused with that. So you see that the particles are getting uh, attracted because of this electro, electro, the paper is getting attracted because of this electro uh, statics. Now, when we also connected it with the oscilloscope, and then we find that when we are rubbing, it is generating these small pi spikes. Those are basically high voltages it is generating. That's, but those high voltages are very, uh, very momentarily. But these materials, if they are, as they are in non contact then uh, insulating almost these polymers and other things, whatever we are using. So the charge will remain there for some time, certain time. So with this concept, we try to develop uh, a mask based on two materials. One is tribopositive, one is triponegative. And... Um, we developed a system how uh, during that time how to measure the filtration efficiency and monitor the pressure pressure top of the system so this was the schematic let's not go into the details of details uh, let's not go into the details of this system so now uh, we know that okay if we we have decided that we have a tribo positive and we have a tribo negative material now to design the mask now when we were trying to design a mask uh, so we thought of uh, all of us know about origami correct so you take a plain sheet of paper you fold it in a particular way and you give them uh, one can give them 3d three-dimensional structures correct so the same way what we did is that basically we took a uh, certain particular design of uh, of uh, fabric Okay, and this is a three layer fabric. The inside was cotton. In between there was a tribo positive and outside there was a tribo negative material. And then we stitch them in such a way that it forms this, uh, forms this cup shaped design. 
okay and uh, what we find so these are the some of the some data about this so these value filtration efficiency this is for 3 micrometer particle we are talking about because when people do the bacteria filtration efficiency they use a 3 micrometer size uh, bacteria on an average so we find that each of these panel they do not have sufficient filtration efficiency but when we put the panel together then the overall efficiency goes up now, as I was saying that breathability is always connected and breathability is nothing but the pressure drop. So um, we always measure, we measure the pressure drop and the pressure drop also uh, goes up as we put three material. Fine. And uh, the next one here, um, what we have shown is that the blue one or the green one, sorry, the green one is discharge panel and then this panel as it has three layers so we took it and we rub it just with each other and then what we find that every time as we are rubbing the filtration efficiency goes up again we took another discharge panel we hit we rubbed it it goes up filtration efficiency goes up and this increase in filtration efficiency is around 18 percent and the overall way to define the quality factor in these cases is basically uh, through this uh, part of line I have shown. And the overall quality factor is very high in this case. If I, I, I think I will have some data for N95, where we will see the quality factor is less than uh, four or five in those cases. So that it tells that this has relatively a uh, addition filtration efficiency with very high breathability. Okay. And just by rubbing the panel, we could enhance the filtration efficiency by 18% without affecting the uh, uh, pressure drop or the breathability. Okay. And this, what we have tested is that after, what is the minimum time we need to rub it? And we see that after 30 seconds of rubbing, rubbing, the kind of filtration efficiency does not increase anymore. That means the charge, whatever we are developing, that is probably getting generated within 30 seconds. We don't, we, we are not able to generate any further charges. And we tried to check how long this charge stay. And we find that it happily stays almost up to two hours or so. Uh, so this experiment was done retention is it's done not while wearing the mask it is just while keeping the mask in the room that is uh, in normal uh, in an air conditioned room that is what we are talking about so if one is wearing the mask this filtration whatever efficiency it has gone up probably that will come down a little bit but one has to again take it out rub it and then wear it again now, this is, again, I come back to this word, seeing is believing, correct? So what I have done here is that, you see uh, the glasses, near the gly glasses, basically the air leaks, correct? Uh, near the nose area. And uh, we are taking an IR, uh, IR image of this person wearing, the, wearing this mask. Let me play the video here. So what you see that near the nose area, it becomes red and the whole mask become red. This is when the person is breathing out the red one. That means the hot air is coming out, correct? And you see that there is slight change in the temperature on near the eyes. So uh, there is uh, the air, and when the person is breathing, it is again coming all throughout the mask. The cold air is coming in, so it becomes black. Now, this is one of the commercial masks. You see here, the change is happening primarily near the eyes. That means the air, hot air is coming out through the nose, nose area, through that leak. Although they have high efficiency, but the breathability uh, is so poor that the, the breath, the, when we are inhaling or exhaling, it is not going through the filtration. Rather, it is just going uh, out of the system. This is another uh, commercial mask which was available at that time in India. Okay, so these are a few examples. So this shows that uh, the mask what we have developed, it is a highly breathable and the uh, air is passing through this, uh, through the mask, not through the leaks. Comparison with N95 mask, uh, what we have found, the breathability for our mask, we developed an equation to define the breathability. We find that breathability is somewhere around 98%. Uh, uh, Using the same equation, the breathability for N95 mask is much lower, around 60%. But certainly, the filtration efficiency for N95 mask is way better than the mask what we have developed. 
Now I have another one or two minutes probably, and uh, I'm just going to talk about that. See, what happened? It happened that I think um, India first lockdown sometime maybe 20th March or something. And then um, we were basically these experiments we were doing in our uh, home and then we have special access to go to the lab and only two of us or three of us were working initially. And the, the idea and the concept it developed between the first two weeks of April. And then what we did, uh, we started, uh, we hired a tailor and then we were making this mask. We were asking them, okay, you stitch this way, you stitch that way, et cetera. We spent a month to do design, to develop the design and testing for the testing in the lab for the mask. And the optimization of the design through different, uh, different uh, processes, basically. It took another one month, 10th April to 10th May. So in this, while designing optimization and the testing were going simultaneously. And then we filed for this uh, mask design and the IP protection on 15th May. By that time, we made some sample copies we sent here and there. And one person, one, um, one of the um, basically um, clothing company in Bangalore, they got interested. And then we did the technology transfer to them on 19th May. So you see that everything was happening very fast that time because that was the demand there. And then on 15th August, uh, they finally came up with their uh, modified product uh, that's called, they call it, uh, this is available as in the name of 3BO. Basically, it represents the tribo. So 3BO, that's what the mask came up with. So this is 3BO mask with a deltoid uh, shape uh, and a sense tech protection. So these are a few things what we, um, it was fun to work with this and then develop this uh, mask um, in this time. So I think uh, I am done. Um, I'm done in the sense when time is up. So with this, I um, acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Asuto Singh, uh, Professor G.U. Kulkarni. And uh, so those are the, so me, Asuto, and Professor Kulkarni, we were involved in developing this mask uh, during the lockdown period. Of course, I thank my uh, students and the, all the group members, as well as my colleagues from, from um, my center, Center for Nano and Soft Matter Sciences. Thank you very much. And if you are interested in knowing more, uh, please feel free to contact me at pshatra at sense.race.in. Thank you. Uh, ben, it's over to you. All right. Thank you. That's a really interesting talk, both, both informational and really cool to see the process of, uh, of coming up with the mask. Um, so we'll go, we'll jump straight into the questions real quick. Um, we've got a couple minutes sure. here. Um, so first, um, can you talk about the the process of choosing the, the two? You, so you had the two triple electric materials, one positive, one negative. Did you try different materials, or did you kind of hit on uh, something that that worked initially? That and then we're you know you kind of went straight into the the development of the of the mask itself, or did you have to try some different materials to sort of figure out which ones worked best? Yeah. See, as we were, uh, as we were, uh, so maybe I'll stay here. The during the pandemic or when the everything was stopped, the supply chain is something what we had worried about, correct? Mm -hmm. So we were looking for material which are easily available in the market, and one of them is polypropylene. Uh, uh, po not polypropylene. Uh, yeah, PP polypropylene, the standard three-ply mask. Mm -hmm. That is a tripo-negative. And then we look for what is the corresponding tripo-positive material it can, it can have. And then we found that nylon is a, a good, easily available material with a tripo-positive. So basically we use nylon, uh, PP, nylon, and cotton. So these are the three materials which we have used in our system. Okay, no, that, that so, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. 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 Probably we could have chosen other material, but if those are not available easily, what is the purpose of uh, you see in this, maybe PTFE, PTFE, you will have much higher triboelectricity, but it you will not get any fabric out of it. So there is no point using that. True. Right. Yeah. So like that, we have decided. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the, I don't think the right word, the, the durability of these masks. So how, how long um, are you able to wear them and, and have them be effective? I have, 
I got it. Yeah. I have not shown lo- uh, a few other, de- by the way, this work is, I have not, I forgot to show the reference. This is published in Energy Technology in 2021, this particular uh, work. And um, what we did is that now if we wash this mask, what happens to it? So we did uh, accelerated washing basically. So in the lab, we were doing the filtration efficiency. We uh, and just after washing, uh, not just after washing. So we prepared the mask. We do the filtration efficiency. We rub it. We do measure the filtration efficiency. We dip it in water, hot water. We take it out. We uh, dry it up and do ironing to do fast drying. And then again, we measure the efficiency and then again, rub it and measure the efficiency. So like this, we have tried at least 20 times and uh, it remained the filtration efficiency almost the same. Nice. And every time it shows this variation, as soon as whenever you were rubbing, the filtration efficiency goes up. Okay. That's interesting. So so I guess you could, it's probably difficult to test, but you could probably imagine that as you're walking around the mask is rubbing you know rubbing on your face the layers rubbing exactly. together and so that in, in theory it should be exactly. increasing it yeah that's very exactly that is what the idea was that when we are speaking correct two layers are touching with each other and tribal electricity is nothing but touching you need the touching between two two different materials it's not really you don't need any pressure the pressure is required so that you get a more surface area contact surface area mm-hmm. okay so we expected, or we uh, we could not prove it. Mm-hmm. We expected that it will have uh, the filtration when we are speaking with this mask. It may have, um, it may be getting charged, but we could not prove it. Okay. Yeah. Um, has, has the mask has this mask seen a lot of uptake? Has it been popular? It 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 is popular. Those who have used this mask, they never went uh, went to went to something else. Okay. Okay, our users, particularly in the close group of users, I have heard that. Um, now, when it comes to uh, the commercially, uh, when someone does, does not know mm-hmm. that this mask is basically produced from one of the DST lab, etc., there are so many different types of masks were right. available uh, in the market, correct? So when you go to the market, you have so many options and then it is hard to choose which one to be picked up. But those who have picked up, they are still using the same mask. Okay, very nice. Yeah. All right, yeah. final question. When, yes. are you, when are you going to be modeling the mask? <laughs> modeling the mask? <laughs> to, to, for, for, oh, the, okay. for the websites. <laughs> <laughs> it is left to the company. They they came up with all these things. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, thank yeah. you again, Dr. Prale. It was a fantastic talk. I really appreciate it. Um, and, and thank you for agreeing to give the talk to. Really great to have you back on. It's my pleasure, Ben. It was very nice talking to you. Fantastic. All right. And talking so, to the audience. Yes. Absolutely. So we will be back in about 10 minutes, everybody, uh, for our next talk. Um, But in the meantime, uh, hang out and uh, we'll be back shortly.